All right, today's lesson is the bread of life. And the scripture reference we're going to be using is John chapter 6, verses 22 to 35. What I have on the screen um, is a picture of Maslow's hierarchy. Um, for those on, uh, I know that you're not online and that's fine. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy or not, but it's basically a pyramid and it's a pyramid of what is perceived to be man's needs or what is understood to be man's needs. And at the base of the pyramid, it talks about the physiological needs, which are like and it has examples of food, water, warmth, rest. Then as you come up to the next tier of the pyramid, it has safety needs, security, safety, you know, that, that might be things like a house or, or something of that nature. And it, off to the side of that, it has those listed as basic needs. And the general thought is that as uh, at Abraham Maslow put this together, the general thought is that as you, as each, level of need is met, then you can progress to the next one. But if you don't have food, water, warmth, and rest, then what do you care so much about safety needs? All right. And then, so then as you go up from there, the next tier of this pyramid is considered belongingness and love needs. So that's like intimate relationships and friends. And then above that is esteem needs. And examples there is like prestige and feeling of accomplishment. And, and off to the side of that, it, it talks about those as being physiological needs, or, or I'm sorry, psychological needs, okay? And then at the top of the pyramid, it's titled self-actualization, self and to the side, is, uh, it's titled, it has a list of self-fulfillment needs. And as a description, it says achieving one's full potential, including creative activities. Okay. Now I'm going to contrast this at at the end. I don't. I'm not going to go as as, as far as saying I, I disagree with with these needs going up. But as Christians, we got to understand that none of this is, is possible even without God. So we'll look at a different pyramid at the end to see how really it, it should be in, in the lives of us. And but the reason why I I brought this one out is because when we look at it from a you know a human point of view and and particularly as we look at this lesson we'll see that what the people are focused on and a lot of people are focused on are the basic needs the two at the very bottom the physiological needs food water warmth rest and the safety needs you know housing and and, and safety security and because people are focused on the bottom this keeps all of us from being able to focus on God. So we need to make God the, the base of this, of, of this pyramid of our, of, our, of our needs so that he can provide all the rest for us. But again, the thing I really want you to, to recognize as we go through this is how the, the focus was really on the base of this of what, what is considered Maslow's hierarchy. And that's what really hindered the people at that time to hear Jesus' message. And that's, that's still what goes on now. And I'll hopefully touch on a few points of, of how we're to deal with that. Okay, so with that, we're going to go ahead and, and start with, in the book that we're using, it's, it's called Where is Jesus? But uh, the, rep, the scriptures we're going to read, it's going to be the first six verses. So John chapter 6, verse 22 to 27. Uh, is there someone who would like to read those verses for me? Yeah, I can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, verse, this will be the New International Version. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but that they had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread 
after the Lord gave given thanks. Once the crowd realized that Jesus, neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you were looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Thank you. Yes. All right, before we get into this, the little bit I want to to bring out from, from this passage, I want to talk, I want to give you a little bit of background of, of leading up to, to where we are in Jesus' ministry right, and, some, and just a little snapshot of some things that, that occurred earlier in John chapter 6. So just before this, Jesus had fed, as is recorded, about 5,000 men. And I know a lot of us as Christians are familiar with that particular event that occurred. Um, it was not often in Bibles, and often everybody, often people say, "Oh, Jesus fed five thousand. and it really says about five thousand men, which means they only counted the men. They didn't count the wives. They didn't count necessarily the children that would have been there. They only counted the men. So who knows? It could have been up to twenty thousand people there. But regardless, it was. It was a significant ta- uh, task because they, as is recorded in John chapter six verse nine, he only had they only had five barley loaves and two small fish to multiply to spread out amongst this mass of people. Now, after they had fed the five thousand, Jesus did blessed it, broke it, and gave it, and gave it to the disciples to give to the people. And after all the people had eaten their fill, in John 6, 13, it says that they gathered up 12 baskets filled with fragments, uh, assumed to be fragments of, of the bread, of the loaves. Now, as you keep reading down in verse 15 of John chapter 6, you'll, you'll come to understand that because of this that occurred, the people wanted to instantly make him king. And so what, what Jesus, Jesus knew this, and so what he did is he ended up isolating himself. And, and in other uh, gospels that record this miracle, it says that Jesus sent them away. He sent the disciples to, to go get into a boat, to, to go sail to uh, Capernaum, I believe it was, and he isolated himself away after he sent the the masses away. Okay, but he didn't he didn't want any part of obviously of them making him king. And as it says in verse 17, the, the disciples then set sail to Capernaum, and then we we witness a. Another miracle that occurred where Jesus meets them uh, walking on the water, and this is recorded in in other Gospels as well, but in verses 19 to 21, it talks about the disciples rowing, and then they see Jesus, and they bring him in. They obviously are frightened at first, and then they bring him into the ship. And the interesting thing that John says is instantly they were at where they were, going as soon as he came into the ship. <laughs> um, I, I just kind of thought that was funny when, when I read it, because in the other Gospels it doesn't say that. It just, it just says that, you know, they eventually got to where they were going. But he says instantly they were at where they were. Um, so just a, another interesting thing to study and look into. But this is where we are in the, in the story. They, the disciples and Jesus had left the masses back over in Bethsaida, and they have gone over to Capernaum, and now the masses are now looking for Jesus. 
Okay. So getting to the points of this verses 22 to 27, the first thing I want to point out is that the people had the correct perception. Okay? They realized in verses 22 to 24 that Jesus was no longer with them. They were seeking for him. And they recognized their lives, something was lacking in their lives without Jesus. Okay? So they had their correct perception. And then as you read into verse 24b, the second part, it says, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. So they had the correct process. They realized that they had a gap, something wasn't complete in their life. They knew that they needed Jesus as, as part of that completeness, and so they went and sought for him. Okay? Now, here's where we get into the problem. They have the incorrect purpose. They have the correct perception, have the correct process, but they have the incorrect purpose. And this is going back to that Maslow's hierarchy that I was talking about. They were only concerned about the bottom layer of, 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 their, of their needs. They were only concerned about their physical well-being. As you look into verses 25 and 26, it says, And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when came you here? And then Jesus, ex Jesus puts it exactly what their issue is and shows, why they, shows how, how and why they had the incorrect purpose. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, You seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. They were just, they didn't even recognize that Jesus had multiplied the bread and the fish. They, they saw it, but that's not what was in their heart. What was in their heart was Jesus provided for our physical need, and we want Jesus to continue to provide for our physical need. So if we stay with him, we won't have to worry about how we're going to get fed. That's why they were there. And the interesting thing about it, too, uh, I never really looked at it this way, but as I started studying it, I feel like when they called him rabbi in verse 25, I feel like that was a bit of more of a, a flattery approach. Um, you know, rabbi, as, as many know, means my master or my teacher. But... They were not there to, rather, to learn, rather uh, to not have to concern themselves with food. And oftentimes, even in, in this day and age, we have a lot of people who approach God the wrong way. They, they, want, him to, they want him to be Lord or they want him to be savior, I mean, but they don't want him to be master. They don't want to obey everything that he says, and, but they, they want him to, to save them from their situation. And that's exactly what we have here. They want, to save, they want him to provide for their needs, but they don't, they're not really there to recognize him of the true position where he should be. And, and I, I, just, I just really see a, a significant issue with that and, and how that continues into this present day and age. You know, when we, when we approach God, when we should always recognize him, us, ourselves, as, as sinners and have him up on the pedestal where he belongs. But moving on, the, the last thing I, I felt I also recognized that I thought was a bit interesting even though that they didn't really recognize him for where he should be, but they did call him rabbi, Jesus, even knowing that they didn't really recognize him as, as where he should be, that didn't, that didn't stop him from fulfilling, that, fulfilling his duty. So what I have on here is Jer Jesus carries out rabbi duties. Even though they don't really recognize him as master and teacher as they should in a spiritual sense, he, that he still carries out the rabbi duties by correcting 
them where they have in, where their purpose is incorrect. And you see that in verse 27 where it says, Labor not for the, for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat, meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Jesus is attempting to redirect their ambitions from the meat or the food, as, as I said in the New, Ash, New International Version, the food that endures to everlasting life. He also instructs of the contrast between the two. There's a contrast between the food that perishes versus the, or spoils versus the food that, that leads to everlasting life. And the contrast is that for the food that perishes, that's what you work for. That's what in the beginning he says, labor not for the for the meat or the food, right? That's what we work for. However, the food that doesn't perish, the food that leads to everlasting life, that's not we what we labor for. What does it say? It says for but for that meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall what? Shall give unto you. It's given. It's not something that's earned. We don't earn salvation. We don't earn Jesus' favor. We believe, and then it's given to us. So there, there's a little bit of a contrast that Jesus is trying to get them to understand. You know, this kingdom of heaven thing, it's not going to be something that you have to work to earn. Um, and we'll, we'll get into, I mean, he'll make it very plain for them. And, and what's kind of sad to see is that many of the people in this crowd they likely ended up not being saved uh, just because they didn't fully understand what, what Jesus was trying to teach them. But there's an interesting phrase in here, and I can't remember if it said it in the New International Version or not. Um, you can certainly uh, update us, Harry, if, 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 it, if it did not. Um, but in the, New, in the King James Version, it says, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. I don't know if... It, Many of you have looked into why he says the Son of Man, um, because you could think, why didn't he reference himself as the Son of God? We, if you continue to read, you, re you recognize that he's talking about himself, G Jesus, but he references specifically the Son of Man. Well, this goes back to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Uh, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to. I, I have it on the screen for, for those that are uh, online, but I'll read, I'll read those verses. But again, it's Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 to 14. It says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and the kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So this vision that Daniel saw about the Son of Man having an everlasting kingdom, obviously that's in reference to Jesus. And so that's why at this point he references himself as the Son of Man and not the Son of God. There are instances where he talks about the Son of God, but then we're also called the sons of God. But nobody, in reference to this, to the Son of Man that Daniel is referencing, nobody can claim that except for Jesus Christ. And that's, that's why he, he references Son of Man there. So just, just thought it was a, a, in case you didn't know that, there's a little point for you. Um, but not, not necessarily critical to the, to the lesson. But just thought I just as I was studying that I just thought it was a good point to bring out. But practical points to be taken away from this passage as we look at the error of the people that were there, we have to understand that we must seek God with the right intentions for the right purpose. We must seek God with the right intentions for the right purpose. They had they had 
the wrong intentions and they had the wrong purpose. Um, or, or you could make the argument that perhaps they had the right intentions but the wrong purpose. You know, they, they knew something was lacking in their lives, but they wanted it just for the food portion. We should want Jesus because of who he is and because of what he can do for our lives, not just for getting something physical out of it. The next point that I want to bring out is that Partaking of God's spiritual provisions is a, is a gift. It's not something that is merited. We work, we seek to do work on this earth in honor of God for what he has done for us. We don't seek to do the work for earning something of God because everything that God provides to us is given to us. It's a gift. It's given. Salvation is a gift. Every, everything that he provides to us is a gift. We don't work to earn it because then it's no more a gift, as, as the Bible says. So as we seek to partake of God's spiritual provision, we got to remember it's, it's gifted. It's not merited. We do work because we love God and we want to honor him, but we don't do it for a reward. I'm going to pause right there in case anybody else has anything that they want to bring out from these first six verses or have any uh, questions or comments. You know, when I was reading this, and so every now and then when I'm reading, I, I, um, I try to imagine what it, would have, what it would have been like to have lived in that time period and would I have made the same mistakes. You know, because we're looking back from from history, so yeah. you know we have that advantage. But they didn't, and I'm thinking they didn't have. Uh, most of them wouldn't have had a personal relationship with God, or even thought they could. Mm -hmm. And Jesus was offering them that. And so they're, you know, they're for many of them that that day on the on when they were they were fed to, they were full. That might have been the first time or one of the few times they actually ate till they were full. Right. And so their immediate needs would have been, you know, in the forefront of their minds, but Jesus was giving them something radically different. He was offering them some, something that probably few of them actually thought about, and that was an eternal life. Uh -huh. And a way to get there, and, you know, we're going to see it in the, in the next verses, you know, how they, you know, how he's offering that to them, but, and I thought I might have made the same mistake. I might have just thought, well, maybe there's something to him, but he's going to show me more. And I think that's what some of them were looking for. They were looking for not only the physical needs to be satisfied, but, you know, for that day, but for the future, because who knows, you know, how they ate and what they ate in that time period. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not good to, when we look back, you know, not to be too critical, because we might have made the same mistake. Yeah. I, I love you say that, and I think I have that coming up here in, in a minute as far as like a something that occurred back then that we would have likely been in the same same boat. But, yeah, I, I, I find it kind of funny sometimes and, and kind of sad sometimes when I hear certain people either teaching or preaching and they're like, look at these foolish people or, you know, like, you know, kind of putting down and it's like, yeah, I don't know that we would have been any different because we had our, our times uh, where God was trying to reach us and we weren't responding. We were responding like knuckleheads. Um, <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't saved all my life. No way. I had my times and, and it's only by the mercy of God that I, I wasn't consumed in that state because I would have eternally been without mm -hmm. God. And I'm sure that's the same for, for most, if not everybody on here. Everybody wasn't born like a Samuel raised up in, uh, in the church, so to speak, and, you know, probably saved from, from childhood, from childbirth. You know, we had, we had our point. So, yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. I appreciate you bringing that up. Anything else from anybody else? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to take the silence that we can move on. So we're going to go to John chapter 6, verse 28 to 31. 
Um, I'll go ahead and read these, and then I'll ask somebody uh, to read the next four verses when we when we go to those. So this is from the King James Version. It says, Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him who he hath sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign show you then that we may see and believe you? What do you work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now this section in the book is called, What Shall We Do? And obviously it comes from verse 28 when they ask Jesus, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Now again, I want, I want you to see, again, how they're focused at the, the base of, of, as I said, Maslow's hierarchy, just on the basic needs, keeps them kind of trapped into their thinking process. And the first thing I want you to see is, is that the general carnality of man is the point that I have. We have a propensity to bring God down to our understanding rather than let him elevate us to his. And that is a major problem in, inside Christian, but especially outside of Christian, Christianity. You know, they try to make God like how we think, you know, and that, uh, like, I'll just give an example, and this, this may turn some people off, but, I, but as Pastor said earlier, we've got to speak the truth. Homosexuality as an example. The Bible speaks clearly against it. The Bible speaks clearly that, that God does not condone homosexuality. But what man tries to do is says, how can God punish two people for loving, from loving one another? They just love one another. They try to bring God down from, to, from where he is to, to say this is right. When God said, no, this is right up here. But that, that's what man tries to do. They try to make God carnal, but he's not. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our, not our thoughts. But we get this from verse 28 where they say, where they ask, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? They, they're thinking, again, from, from verse 27, that they need to labor. They need to do something to, to earn this, Right? And that's why they're saying, what, what shall we do to, to, to earn this? This is how it is in this natural world, so this, was, this, must have to, this has to be how uh, heaven is. This has to be how we earn you know, what we, whatever we get from God. We have to do something for it. They heard the labor part in verse 27, but they did not hear the give part in verse 27 that Jesus said. So if, we, if you think back to probably the most popular scripture in, in the whole Bible, John chapter 3, verse 16, the first part says, For God so loved the world that he, what? He gave, right? Gave. He gave, right? He, he so loved the world that he gave. That's the first part, okay? We'll get to the second part in this next verse. So now, in verse 29, we see the correction of God, or the correction of Jesus. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. Jesus shows us that our job is to believe. To believe what? To believe upon him, upon Jesus, and all that he tells us to do. Now, that's the second part of John chapter 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, Part B, that whomsoever shall believe upon him shall, should have everlasting life and should not perish. That's the work that we do. That's all we do. We believe. Now, as I was, as I was talking a little bit earlier, as, as Harry made that phenomenal point, after we believe, we then change the works that we do. We don't change the works that we do uh, to try to earn something, because we've al once we believe, we've already earned, we've already been given. I shouldn't say earned. We've already been given 
uh, everlasting life. It's been given to us. It's a gift. So the works that we do from that point are now be, to reflect the love that we have for God and to reflect the belief that we have. I, I gave a, I was teaching Sebastian one time a lesson, and Audrey as well, that if I told you not to go down some alley because there was a vicious dog down there and you went down that alley anyway, did you really believe what I said? No, you wouldn't believe what I said because you went down there. Now, if you don't go down there, there's some form of belief that you have in what I in what I told you because you changed some habit. Like, let's say that was a way that you went all the time to go to school, as, as an example. You changed the habit that you normally would do because you're like, well, he said there was a dog down there, so I'm not going to go down there. And that's, that's the analogy that I, that I wanted them to see is that we change – not not because we're trying to earn something. We change because we're we're trying to we're we're showing that we love God and we believe what He says, and so we 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 do what He says. Um. But this is also a point that I was going to bring up that that related to what Harry was saying. The disciples, when Jesus was crucified, they did not remember. And they did not believe what Jesus had told them. All the time leading up, as you read through John, as you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, they all record that Jesus was trying to educate them before he was even crucified that it was going to happen and, and that he was going to raise from the dead. Now, most of them, after they saw him believed, you know, I think John is the only one that records that he believed before him, he saw him. But all the rest of them, they didn't believe until after they saw it. And in that, you know, we again, some, some may talk about it in such a highly negative way. And, and I'm not saying it was a good thing. It wasn't a good thing. But I don't, I'm not sure that we would have been any different. If we would have been there at that same exact time, you know, there were two, there were basically two crowds of people. There was the crowd that was saying crucify him, and there was those that were the silent bystanders. Which one would we have been in? Would we have been in the crucify him, or we would, would or would we have been in the silent bystander? Either way, you've been you would have been in one, and you wouldn't have been on Jesus' side at that particular time. So we're we're no different. But anyhow, moving on. In verse thirty. Uh, the point that I brought out was that blind eyes equals an unbelieving heart. So as we look at verse 30, it says, They said, therefore, unto him, What signs show you then that we may see and believe you? What do you work? Now, they had already experienced this, this feeding of the 5,000. That's why they followed him that's why they sought to seek him, following him to uh, Capernaum. When they're in Bethsaida, they left, they left there. They, actually, let me back up a second. Before they even went to Bethsaida, Bethsaida is where the feeding of the about 5,000 men occurred. They followed him there because even before that, as is recorded in John and in the other Gospels, he was healing sick, and they saw him doing that. And they're like, oh, wow. this!" And, and even in Bethsaida, it's talked about that they brought sick to him, and he healed them, and they saw all that. Then they say it saw him feed this mass of people with five loaves of bread and two fish. And they're coming to this point now saying, what sign do you show that we may see and believe? You just saw numerous signs, and you still didn't believe. You still don't recognize. Um, so this blind eyes equals it leads to their unbelieving heart because even seeing, they don't see, and in hearing, they don't hear. And then so in verse 31... I wrote down the point was that now we have a prophetic confirmation of verse 26. So let's go back to verse 26 for just a moment. 
Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, You seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. And so now let's jump back down to verse 31. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said in verse 26, You didn't follow me because of miracles. You followed me because you were fed. And then verse 31, they, even, they now confirm they're not following because they saw a miracle. They're following because of bread. The first, thing, the first miracle they bring up is, hey, when, Moses, when, when our fathers were back in, in the desert, they had manna, and they saw that. And now the thing about it, what they, what they missed on that is how many of the people were saved that were in the wilderness? We don't know the exact number, but I think we can understand. We I think it's it's understood and believed by by all that not many were saved, and that's actually why part of why they kept wandering in the desert. God God was rooting out those those unbelieving hearts so that He could start with a start with a, a new crop of people that that would believe Him for who he, who He was. But not many were saved in the desert. They, and even, even before that, God had sent at least seven miracles before that. When, when he was having Moses and Aaron go before Pharaoh to let the people go, they, he did all the miracles of the, of the frogs and the lice and the, all the different plagues and whatnot, um, culminating with, obviously, the... the killing of the firstborn and the setup of Passover, right? And then even as they departed, what, what did he do? He parted the Red Sea. But the very first thing that they bring up is he gave, he gave manna from heaven. He gave us bread. That was a sign that he gave us. This, to me, was very interesting, and it really makes you recognize and understand Ecclesiastes 3.18 where it says, I said in mine heart concerning the estate of the sons of men that God might manifest them, manifest them and that they might see that they themselves are beasts. Now, he says that for multiple reasons, but one way to get loyalty of an animal is to feed it. That's a major way. I remember when I was a little kid and there was a stray dog that was running around, and I already, we already had two dogs at the time, and I kind of felt bad for it, so I fed it and gave him some water. And my mom was like, oh, that was the worst thing you can do because now it's just going to keep coming back. And it did start coming back until I stopped or, or somebody, somebody must have grabbed it or something. Um, but eventually it stopped coming back. Um, but you want the loyalty of an animal, you just feed it. <laughs> and that's... That, as I was reading this, that's kind of the image that I had. It's like they they just keep bringing up this bread thing. They keep bringing up this bread thing that almost like just feed us Jesus and we'll be loyal to you. But but the problem with that is stop feeding them and then what happens? Then they forget. <laughs> just like beasts. So practical points I want to bring up about this. As we seek Christ, we must subdue our flesh to let the mind of Christ rule in us. We have to understand that a, a lot of our desires are driven by our flesh, but we have to subdue those to let that mind of Christ rule. These people couldn't do that. They kept just appeal, wanting to appeal to the flesh, feed us, feed us, feed us, instead of hearing mm -hmm spiritually what God what, what Jesus was trying to say to them. Now the next point, the next practical point I wanted to bring up, we must understand those whom we seek to reach, the lost, must be changed by the Spirit of God. Jesus keeps reiterating to them over and over again, trying to expound to them the spiritual things that he's trying to say. That's the same thing we do. We just speak the word of God to people, to the, to the lost. But it's not our job to change them. Our job is to spread the gospel. 
but they are changed by the Spirit of God. So I'm bringing this up because we can learn everything that Jesus does. He shows us the perfect way to interact with believers, with non-believers. He shows us the perfect way every single time. And he continues, I'm going to continue, even though you keep trying to bring me back to the physical, I'm going to continue to speak to you spiritual things so that you might have life. And that's what we have to do. But, we, but it's not our job to change. Just the, they, everybody is changed by the Spirit of God. If you even think about how you ended up becoming, sa became, becoming saved, it wasn't because somebody just brought you a message, but the Spirit of God weighed on you constantly until you finally confessed your sins and believed on Jesus Christ. So with that, I'm going to pause before we go into our last section. Uh, if anybody else has anything they want to bring up for these verses or has any questions. Yeah, Deacon Robson, I, I just wanted to share that, you know, I, I agree, especially um, with your last point, that a lot of times people really think that, you know, that it's always due to some other factor um, that leads people to salvation, but it's, it, it's like you just said, it's the Spirit of God that does the work, and a lot of times we get caught up in the doing, um, just, you know, just, just like they did, and a lot of the religious leaders did, they get caught up in, you know, the doing and the tradition and the practices versus who actually does the work, and I think that, you know, if we, if we keep that in mind of who's the one that's actually doing the work within the hearts of man, then we'll then pray harder, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll then intercede more, we'll then, you know, kind of do the things that, you know, God has called us to do in loving one another and realizing that, you know, all our job is to bring people uh, to Christ and to share the gospel and to share our testimonies and things like that. But it's ultimately the spirit that, that does the, the, the renewing of the mind, the chaining of the heart, the piercing of the heart and things like that. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Jimmy. Yeah. Uh, did I hear somebody? I thought I heard somebody else might, about to chime in. Somebody else say something? Well, I was just thinking about, you know, how uh, God, when they were in the desert, how God was giving them bread, manna from heaven. And that was just a temporary thing. And it just seemed like they just didn't get the fact that Jesus was the true bread, you know. Absolutely. I was looking at that point. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll, yeah. we'll touch on that more in the last four verses. Okay. All right, so I'll ask uh, if there's someone might want to read the last four verses, 32 to 35 in chapter 6. Okay. Yeah, I can read I'll the read, last Brother Dan. Oh. I, I can oh, you read. Go ahead. Okay. I'll, who is that? Harry, you want to read? I'll read. Go, go ahead, Lois. Okay, 30. Okay, 32 uh, to 35, you said? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Amen. Thank you. Well, all right. Well, let me not rush, but let me try to get through these uh, fairly quickly to bring up the to not keep you too long. The first thing I want to uh, point out here is that Jesus now gives a spiritual correction. You know, the people said, it, they, essentially what they're alluding, alluding to was Moses gave us bread from heaven. And, but in verse 32, Jesus corrects them. I, barely, barely, I say unto you, Moses didn't give you that bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. First off, 
Moses was not the source. God was the source. And likewise, God, again, is giving you the necessity of sustaining life. Now, this, the difference in this is now he's not, we're not talking about a physical bread, although the Bible is evident, too. If, if, I mean, again, they didn't have the Bible, but for us, the Bible is evident that we're not to take care of what we eat or what we drink or what we shall put on for uh, our Heavenly Father provides those things for us, as the Scripture says. But he's trying to get them again to lift up their eyes to the hills from which come their help, to, to lift up from the, from the carnal things to the spiritual things, saying, you know, you're not recognizing what God did. God gave you that bread, not, not Moses, and likewise he's giving you the bread again. He's giving you that, 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 the thing that you need to sustain your life. Um, now, he also gives them a hint in verse 33. It says, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So now he's trying to get them this. I have on, on the slide that the hint given, it's a who-ness, not a whatness. Verse, and I'll explain in just a second. Verse 3 says, I'm sorry, verse 33 says, he which comes down from heaven is the bread of God. That he, obviously, is Jesus. Yeah. And I say it's a who-ness because the bread is who. It's not a what. Manna it comes from the Hebrew word man, which means a wetness. When they saw the manna on the ground, they called it, or they would have called it man. We say manna. But they called it man because they're like, there's a wetness on the ground. They're like, what is it? We'll just call it a what is it. We don't know what it is. We're just going to pick it up, and this is what God's given us to eat. It was a wetness. But now it's not a wetness. It's a who-ness. It's who, and the who is Jesus Christ. Yeah. And then we see that they miss it even still yet again, because in verse 34 it says, Then they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. So they missed it again. They're, they're, they're still thinking so physically, so carnally minded, that they missed. It's not, it's not a what. It's a he. It's a who. It's he. Their flesh is blinded again, thinking of what they can eat to gain life. So now Jesus plainly speaks to them in verse 35. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And this is where our passage ends, but if you kept reading, you'll see that there are still a lot of people who didn't get it, get it and a lot of people turned away from him, from following him. And so it's a little bit of a sad story. But anyhow... It, this is the point of this, though, is not about a physical consumption, but rather a commitment of the soul. Now, we, many of us understand that the soul is described as the seat of, the, of our thoughts, our will, and our emotion. And on those, I, I looked up three verses to, to really correspond and drive this point home for us. Uh, the first verse is 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 deals with the thoughts. It says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So this commitment of the soul has to do with the thoughts. We have to bring our thoughts into subjection. Then the next one is the will. A verse for the will is Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So we have to commit our thoughts. We have to commit our will to his will. We have to commit our will to doing his will. And the last one is, is emotion. And Pastor talked on this a lot today, talked about get, getting our emotions in check, right, as part of devotion. So 
I didn't know he was going to teach on that. He didn't know wh where, I, where the Spirit was going to take me, but we see that the Holy Spirit working together, bringing two separate messages prepared by, prepared by two different people at two different times, bringing it back to the same point. That's how you know that the Spirit of God is, is really working on us. But Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and verse 32 Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32. I'm repeating it twice because there may be people who want to write it down. But, it's, but they say, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. We see there that all that bitterness and wrath and anger all those are emotions. And then he says, replace them with what? Be, being kind, being tenderhearted, being forgiven. We're to, we're to commit all our entire soul into following Jesus. So the last couple practical points, and then I, I promise we would get to another pyramid, just contrasting. Um, and I'll have to go through that kind of quickly to not keep you too long. But... The first practical point is endeavor to reach the lost, understanding that it may take multiple attempts and prayer. That's what, that's what uh, Brother Jimmy was talking about, that as we, seek to, as we seek to reach them, bringing them the word, we, we understand that it's the Spirit of God, and, and then we continue to make attempts, but we pray for them as well. And we also have to understand that humans fail. We're going to fail. I'm going to fail. You're going to fail. We're all going to come short of, of God's glory. But what we have to understand that when you have a life with Christ, God's promises for us never fail. John 3.16 says that whosoever believes on him should have everlasting life. The moment you believe, you have everlasting life. Now, you're going to fail, we're going to have problems, we're going to make mistakes, but that everlasting life, we have it as long as we are committed and stay, stay with Christ from the moment we believe, from the very moment we believe. It's not something that's earned. So we got, and I bring this up because um, that's what's talked about in verse 35. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. He, to, um... He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Those are promises that are given to us, and they're eternal promises that will never fail. So I'm going to go ahead and go to this last slide. I know most people can't see it, uh, but, but that's okay. It's a contrast of Maslow's hierarchy, and it's, it's called a biblical hierarchy of, of human needs. And uh, it was put together by... Uh, apparently by a lady, Darlene N. Bosick, B-O-C-E-K. Um, so you can look it up on, online, Biblical Hierarchy of Human Needs. At the base of the pyramid, it talks about reconciliation with God. And then it gives some scriptures, 2 Chron uh, Corinthians 5.20, uh, Luke 10, 41 to 42. We don't have time to go into all those. Uh, and... I'll post this out on YouTube. You can go back and look at that last slide if I'm going too fast. But the base of it is reconciliation with God because once you have reconciliation with God, everything else flows from that. So even all those needs that Maslow identified, once we reconcile with God, we don't have to worry about what we eat, what we sleep. We don't have to worry about safety and security. We don't have to worry about becoming our full self because God's going to work out his will through us. But then be, be, built upon that, the next level of the pyramid is peace, joy, and love from the Holy Spirit. And then there's some, some biblical references there, Romans 15, 13, Matthew 10, and 31. And then built up from there, it talks about fellowship with the church. Uh, given uh, biblical references, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, and 1 Peter 4 and 8. Then it gets into physiological needs, Philippians uh, 4, 19, uh, and then Matthew 6 and 8, and Psalm 23. And then at the very top of the pyramid, it talks about safety needs, referenced in Hebrews 5 and 7. I do encourage you to go and look at this. I thought this was a nice uh, 
really pyramid, really organizing how, how the Christian life should be. And it all starts with being reconciled to God. Now with that, I'm going to end. I'm a little bit past time, but uh, I will definitely pause if anybody else has anything else that they want to discuss or bring up from this lesson. Good, uh, good lesson uh, this morning. I want to thank you for bringing us the lesson. Uh, just something that I thought about here. I remembered reading um, John six thirty five um, about about a week ago there, and I had read some commentary, and they were, and the uh, the author was telling us that um, a lot of us, well, that we were created um, in neediness, um, so that he was saying that we are needy uh, by default, and so he was stating that you know how. Um, God could have hardwired us, you know, to need nothing, right? But instead, he made us dependent on things like food and oxygen and sleep and sunlight and things like that, and that his design um, for the world and for us was intentional with specific needs and then certain limitations. And so by default, he was stating that we are needy. But just as just like we need food and we need water, you know, that are essential for us in life every day, we also need him. And, and, and our spiritual truths and, and things to understand, you know, that connect us with God. And so he was stating that, you know, how we need Jesus even more than we need the essentials of life. And I think that a lot of people, you know, as they were, as they were going through and, and seeing the miracles that Jesus was doing, they, they failed to realize that the, the, the magnitude of who Jesus was, not just for what Jesus could provide. And I think... Time and time again, like you were stating earlier, that a lot of times, you know, we think that, you know, when we see these type of things, um, that it wouldn't have applied to us. You know, oh, I, I think I would have seen exactly what Jesus was talking about, and you know, I, I agree. No, I, I don't. I don't. I think we probably would have been in the same boat. But I think, you know, with one thing that Jesus wants is just wants to show us, you know, just kind of through, is that our fulfillment ultimately comes through Him. And, you know, to be fulfilled is, is, is so critical and key, especially when you get to a point to know that it's bigger than just like, you know, in the chart that you show, the safety or the, the safety needs or the psychological needs and things like that. God fills all of them, you know, um, re re regardless of how big or how small the need is. Because not only does he not, not only does he know what our need is, but he is already have plans to fulfill them. And I think a lot of times we think that whenever we are in need that there is no plan that God may not be watching or things like that to help us in our need. But he, he knows what our needs are. He has a plan for us. And ultimately those plans, because they're bigger than what we can imagine, when he does, you know, miracles through, you know, let's just say the smallest thing of like, oh, how is he going to feed 5,000 people with something so small? It's the same way as, you know, how is he going to pay that light bill or water bill when you have zero dollars in the bank? It, it, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. It, it, it's the same mm -hmm. way. And when we see it happen, it blows us away. But the entire time he's saying this is the same equivalent as giving you water and food that you need every day. I can do these same things, um, um, you know, for you in, in your life if, if, you would, if you would accept me. So. Really, I really, I really enjoyed the lesson, and, and I think there's so much there, you know, for us to, to take in today's time. So, so uh, thank you, thank you for just uh, delivering the lesson to us this morning. No problem. Thank you, Jimmy, and very, very excellent points. You're absolutely right. Any, any, anybody else have anything? Okay.